Amen. Thank you. It's Matt, right? Didn't you say something this morning via Twitter that if you couldn't pronounce my name, you were just going to say, bro? All right. I saw that. I just want you to know I saw that. It's a real privilege to be here. Thank you, Dr. Aiken, for the invitation. I was flying up yesterday and trying to think of some of the differences between Presbyterians and Baptists, and there really aren't a whole lot, but I was preaching through, I am preaching through uh, the book of Job on Sunday mornings at Coral Ridge. The title of the sermon series is The Gospel of Suffering, and I quoted Samuel Rutherford this past Sunday where he wrote, when I am in the cellar of affliction, I look for the Lord's choicest wines. And I stopped and said, he must have been a Presbyterian. <laughs> and then I interrupted my own sermon and said, I just can't help myself. I have to say a joke that I heard not long ago. What's the difference between running into a Presbyterian in a liquor store and running into a Baptist in a liquor store? the Presbyterian will say hello to you. <laughs> Beyond that, we basically have everything else in common, and I actually hate wine. My wife likes wine. Uh, I can't stand it. Uh, but anyway, it really is a privilege to be here. Um, I want to I wanna, uh, focus your attention this morning on Colossians. I preached a sermon series all of last winter and spring through the book of Colossians. I'd never preach through Colossians before. My habit is to go through books of the Bible, and I typically go New Testament, Old Testament, New Testament, Old Testament, and I preach through the book of Jonah, um, and then I was asking God to help me uh, figure out what I wanted to preach from the New Testament next, and Colossians was where he led me, and I entitled that sermon series, Jesus Plus Nothing Equals Everything. Uh, and I want to read just this morning briefly from chapter 1, verse 9 through verse 14. And let me just preface my reading of this scripture by saying these verses, and I'll talk about this later, but these verses saved my life in the summer of 2009 when I was going through what at that point was by far the most difficult season of my life. It was these verses that God used to help me rediscover the beauty and the brilliance of the gospel, and it really saved my life. So give careful attention to the reading of God's Word. Verse 9, chapter 1, and so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Verse 13, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And may God add rich, otherworldly blessing to this reading of his holy and inspired word. Let me pray for us. Come thou fount of every blessing and tune every heart and every mind to see and to savor your amazing grace. We pray, O oh God, that you would send your spirit now to be our teacher and to be our instructor. We need your spirit to illumine our hearts and our minds so that we would see here in your word what you intend for us to see. And so I pray that today we would leave here because of your ministry to us, that we would leave here with informed minds and enlarged hearts and bent wills, ready and willing to do whatever you call us to do. Father, I pray that you would speak loudly and clearly, that you would speak convincingly and compellingly 
I pray that you would forgive me of my sin and that you would cleanse me from all unrighteousness and that you would be pleased to use this fallible servant to communicate your infallible truth. So do it, we pray. Preach, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the features of all of Paul's letters, really, the Apostle Paul's letters, and you find this in a number of other places in Scripture, obviously, but one of the unique features of Paul's letters, at least it's most explicit in Paul's letters, is that he never ever begins any of his letters by telling us what we must do, ever. In fact, here in Colossians, it's Colossians is four chapters long, and he spends the first two chapters telling us glowingly what God in Christ has already done for us. And it's not until he gets to chapter 3 that he begins to say, therefore, in light of what God in Christ has done for us, you should go out and live this way. Ephesians is the same thing. Ephesians is six chapters, and in the first three chapters of Ephesians, Paul says, this is what God in Christ has done for you. He marinates his readers in gospel indicatives, what God in Christ has done for you. And it's only after he marinates his readers in the gospel, in what God in Christ has done for us, then he tells us how we should live, what we should therefore do in light of what God has done for us. And that tells us something really, really important. I think this is a super, super important issue in the church today, especially as it concerns preaching, because I think a lot of preaching, in my opinion, a lot of preaching moves right past gospel indicatives, or they assume gospel indicatives, and they move right to the gospel imperatives, because a lot of preachers assume that everybody who's listening to them knows what God in Christ has done for sinners, and now we really need to get to the hard work of living this out. Now, I'm all for obedience and living it out, but I think God is primarily concerned with a long obedience in the same direction. And if there is any engine smaller than the gospel that is motivating us to obey, it will eventually conk out. I can get people, I, for instance, I've got two teenage boys. Pray for me. My mother, okay, has been praying for years for revenge in the form of my own children, okay? So every morning I wake up and I look at all three of them with a smile and I think, which one of you is it going to be? Thankfully, they're so much better than I was uh, when I was a teenager, but I can get all three of my children to do what I'm telling them to do or to do what I'm asking them to do by giving them a healthy mixture of fear and guilt. I can get them to do it. I can make them afraid. I can, I can pronounce consequences if they don't obey. I can get them afraid. I can make them feel guilty. Think of everything your mother does for you. Think of everything I do for you. You know, I can get them to do what I'm asking them to do by giving them a little fear and a little guilt, but it's not going to penetrate the heart. They're not going to obey because they get to. They're going to obey because they have to. And as I've said on numerous occasions, God in the Bible is not concerned with any kind of obedience. He's concerned with a certain kind of obedience. And the sacrifice of Cain and Abel is one of the best Old Testament examples of that. Both did what God asked them to do. But one of them, one of their sacrifices was received, the other sacrifice was rejected, and the primary reason one was received and one was rejected was the disposition of the heart. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't obey even if we don't feel like it. I, I, we, we need to obey even if we don't feel like obeying, okay? But that's a far different thing than saying we just do right because it's right to do right, regardless of what motivates us. God cares about what motivates our obedience. God cares about what motivates our obedience for a number of reasons, one of which is anything smaller than the gospel which motivates our obedience won't last. Any obedience that is not grounded in the gospel is unsustainable. It won't last. 
We need the large engine of the gospel to fuel our obedience. Anything smaller than that will cause us to quit and conk out. So I, I, I bring all of this up by way of introduction to simply say, preachers, follow Paul's example in this regard. Don't assume the gospel. Don't move right to what people must do without first soaking them in what God in Christ has already done. Paul never does that, never. He always, always grounds, this is the you know, technical way of saying it, he always grounds the horizontal imperative in the vertical indicative. Always. Okay, he always, always soaks gospel obligations in gospel declarations because he cares deeply about what motivates our obedience and what will cause our obedience to last long. So, I say all of that because I want us to get a good grasp of the fact that the gospel focuses on Jesus' performance for us, not on our performance for him. Now think about this. I'm going to get into how liberating this was for me. But think about this. The gospel is the good news that the determining factor in my relationship with God is not my past or my present, but Christ's past and Christ's present. The gospel tells us that God does not relate to us based on our feats for Jesus, but on Jesus' feats for us. That's what the gospel is. It's good news that comes from the outside. And it tells us something about what Jesus has done. The Bible has a lot to say about how Christian people ought to live in light of what Jesus has done, but it never moves past what Jesus has done quickly. It soaks us in that. So that when we do get around to living in light of what God in Christ has done for us, we will have the right perspective and the right motivation to press on and strain forward. Because listen, this is, this is, this is the secret of the gospel. This is the irony of gospel-based sanctification. The secret of the gospel is that we actually perform better as we grow in our understanding that our relationship with God is based on Christ's performance for us and not our performance for him. Okay, think about that irony for a minute. That's counterintuitive to think that way. There are a lot of books and a lot of sermons being preached these days regarding how we must perform for Jesus. And I'm, I'm thrilled. Praise God. Who, who doesn't want Christians to press on and strain forward in great radical obedience? That's great. Okay? We love that. Leave it all on the field for the sake of Jesus. We believe that. We love that. In fact, you know, I think that there's far too much complacency and lethargy in the church today. But we're never, ever going to be successful, or the people that we write to or preach to are never going to be successful in their obedience if we assume the gospel. It's never going to work. It'll last for uh, six weeks. It'll last for six months. It may even last for six years for those people who have great willpower. But it'll never last for 60 years unless it is first soaked in the gospel. Preachers, listen, do not make the mistake of skipping over or assuming the indicatives so that your entire preaching ministry is identified primarily by the imperatives. Don't do it. You will create moralists if you do that. Your ministry will generate great Pharisees if you do that. And Jesus reserves his harshest criticism for the religious people, the good people, the moral people, the people who kept all the rules and were very proud of the fact that they were not like them. 
I say this to the people at Coral Ridge regularly. If your ministries, if your preaching ministry, if your teaching ministry, if your local church ministry is not attracting the same kinds of people that Jesus attracted, then you're not preaching the same message Jesus preached, period. Okay, if, if, if your church is, if the church where I pastor is filled with moralists and Pharisees, then we're not preaching the gospel. And as the great Martin Lloyd-Jones said, well, probably the preacher that has influenced me more than any other preacher outside of my grandfather, okay? <laughs> I got to say that because there will be a report that goes up the mountain and I've got to say, he's first, Jesus, Daddy Bill, Martin Lloyd-Jones, okay? Um, but as Martin Lloyd-Jones said, if people do not charge you with antinomianism, you're not preaching the gospel. And he was not endorsing antinomianism. Anyone who knows the ministry of Martin Lloyd-Jones knows he wasn't an antinomianist. He cared a lot about obedience and pressing on and straining forward. He cared a lot about God's law. But the gospel is so radical and so scandalous and so counterintuitive that some people will hear it and say, you're an antinomian. You don't care about God's law. You don't care about obedience which is not true, but that's what, you know, it's so fascinating to me that, you know, you look at, you look at uh, Romans chapter, let's see here, let me get there, <clears throat> Romans chapter 5, you know, uh, the Apostle Paul writes of death in Adam and life in Christ, and he speaks about the radical nature of God's amazing grace and the scandalous nature of the gospel and God's outrageous mercy and all of those things. And then notice what he assumes. The question of the Apostle Paul assumes in chapter 6, verse 1. In light of what he has just said, he says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may, ab may abound? In other words, he is, he's assuming that the people who are reading or listening are going to say, Now wait a second, in light of what you've just told us, am I hearing you correctly? that God's acceptance of sinners is so unconditional and so radical and so outrageous that we can go on sinning and God doesn't care? Now, of course, he says, by no means. That's not what I'm saying. But the very fact that he assumed they would ask that question tells us something about how remarkably radical what he said in chapter 5 is. I mean, if your preaching is not chapter 5 type preaching that causes people to lean toward this question and then correct it, then you're not preaching the gospel. So, it's super important for us to understand that God's acceptance of us, we sang about it already this morning, God's acceptance of us cannot be gained by our successes or forfeited by our failures because it's not about you or me. It's about Jesus, his active obedience in his life, his passive obedience in his death, his resurrection which guaranteed that all things in Christ will one day be made new, all things. You get to Revelation, Jesus comes back and says, behold, I make all things new. Notice he doesn't say, behold, I make all new things. He is coming back to restore, regenerate, and renew his entire cosmic order, okay? So, when we think about the gospel, we think primarily about Jesus, okay? The cross is not the center of the gospel. The resurrection is not the center of the gospel. Jesus' life is not the center of the gospel. Jesus is the center of the gospel. His life, his death, his resurrection, all three are necessary in order for the good news to come our way. His law-fulfilling life, his death-defeating death, and his resurrection, which guarantees that one day all things will be made new, which is why Sinclair Ferguson describes the gospel as simply union with Christ. Because when we are united to Christ, all that is his becomes ours. So the gospel's about Jesus. It's not about you. It's not about your obedience. It's not about your performance. It's about Christ's obedience. It's about his performance for you. So that, as I just said, those who actually grow and develop and mature 
are those people who understand, those who get better in life, are those people who understand that their relationship with God is not grounded first in their performance for Jesus, but in Jesus' performance for them. That's what we call gospel-motivated, gospel-soaked sanctification. The gospel doesn't just justify us, it also sanctifies us, and it will one day glorify us. Uh, Jerry Bridges in his incredible book, Transforming Grace, which I highly recommend to all of you, um, says, you know, this is the way Christians typically think of grace when it comes to justification, sanctification, and glorification. Justification is by grace alone, and glorification is by grace alone, but sanctification is by our work alone. Now, I know God says, work out what work out, you are to work out with fear and trembling what I have worked in. We're going to get into that in a second. So there is cooperation, there is God-dependent effort, but the effort that you put forth in pressing on and straining forward is made possible only by God's grace alone. There is no working out without God first working in. And so it's super important, and I think, in my opinion, that people probably need to hear less about all we need to do for God and hear more first about all that God has already done for us because the only people who really get better are those who understand that our relationship with God does not depend on our getting better. Did you hear that? Okay, that sentence changed my life. And as a result, I've gotten better, okay? The only people who really get better are those who understand that they're, who those who increasingly understand that their relationship with God is not based, grounded in whether or not they get better. Because it's not about you, it's about, it's about Jesus. So, in light of these verses here, um, I used to think, let me tell you about what, how I used to think of Christian growth. Okay? I used to think that in order to grow... I had to go out and get something I did not have, okay? That Christian growth and spiritual maturity and development, spiritual development happens as I go out and get what I don't have. So if I need to be more loving or if I need to be more patient or if I need to be more gracious or all of the fruits of the Spirit, I need to go out and get more love. I need to go out and get more patience. I need to go out and get more joy. But listen, and this is what these verses tell us so compellingly, Christian growth does not happen by working hard to get something you don't have. Christian growth happens by working hard to live in the reality of what you do have. It's exactly what Paul says here. This is exactly what's going on in Paul's prayer here. This is what he's saying, okay? Let me just summarize what he's saying in these verses. He's saying, I pray that you would grow in knowledge, that your understanding would increase, that you'd be strengthened with all power. I I pray that you would grow in endurance and patience and joy, that, that your experience of all of these things would develop. That's what he says. But then notice where he locates the power to make these things real. He says all of these things in chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, and parts of verse 12. But then notice, where does he anchor this so that we can experience the reality of what he has just prayed for? Verse 13 and 14. The gospel. This is what he's saying, okay? Okay. You will grow in your understanding of God's will, be filled with spiritual wisdom and understanding, increase in your knowledge of God, be strengthened with God's power, which will produce joy-filled patience and endurance, as you come to a greater realization that you have already been qualified, delivered, transferred, redeemed, and forgiven. Okay, now in my Bible, I have those five words circled, and if you're not using a pew Bible, circle them in yours too. In fact, circle them if you are using a pew Bible because it'll benefit the next guy. But this is what he's saying. He's saying, this is, you will grow in your understanding of God's will. You'll develop. You, you will mature. You, you will become everything that I am praying for you to become 
How? How, Paul? How is that going to happen in my life? It will happen as you, as you come to a greater realization that you've already been. All of these words are past tense. You've already been delivered, transferred. You've already been qualified, redeemed, and forgiven. These things have already happened. If you are in Christ, this is your position. And so the ongoing exhortation from the Bible is to become practically what you already are positionally. That's gospel-based sanctification. Become what you already are. That's how you grow. You don't go out and get something you don't already possess. If you are in Christ, then all that is his has become yours already. And the hard work of growth is becoming increasingly aware of what you already possess. I, I made reference to it earlier, but 2009 was by far the most painful year of my life for a couple of reasons. One, um, if some of you may know this story, that the church that I planted in 2003 back home in South Florida merged with Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church, which had been planted in 1959 uh, by Dr. Kennedy. And Dr. Kennedy had died in 2007, and they went looking for a pastor. And they came to me in the spring of 2008, and I was humbled, I was honored, and I said, no. And then they came to me again in the summer of 2008 and said, would you reconsider? And I was humbled, and I was honored, and I said, again, a little bit louder this time, no. And then they came to me in December of 2008 and said, would you reconsider? At that point, I said, the only way that I would ever consider doing this is if the church that I planted merged with Coral Ridge. There was no way that I could ever imagine leaving the church that God had used me to start to go nine miles down the road. I would feel like I was abandoning my family if I would do that. And so I said, no. Anyway, to make a very long story short, uh, in uh, April of 2009, Easter Sunday, the two churches became one brand new church, and the celebration was glorious, incredible, for about... 10 days, okay? <laughs> My actual honeymoon was longer than that, okay? It's like 14 days. Didn't even get that. And then all of the fireworks that we anticipated started to go off. We knew this was going to be really, really tough because it was, a, it was a clash of cultures in many regards. While both churches were Presbyterian and while both churches were doctrinally in agreement and theologically in agreement, they were very culturally different. And so, it, you know, all these things started to blow up. And I can remember things were really, really getting painful in the summer of 2009, and my family and I vacation on the southwest coast of Florida. We live on the southeast coast. We were vacation on the southwest coast of Florida. Um, and the first day of vacation, I went, sat on our balcony, looking over the Gulf of Mexico, beautiful. And I opened my, my Bible, my discipleship journal Bible reading plan had me reading Colossians. So I opened up my Bible to Colossians chapter 1, and I started reading these verses. And I got to these verses in uh, chapter 1, verse 9, and all these things Paul was praying for, filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks. All of these things I'm reading, and I'm thinking, I need all of that. I was so weary and so discouraged, and I can remember sitting on my balcony and basically crying out to God this, what have you done? What have you done? I mean, life was going so remarkably well. God was doing great things in our church and great things through our church at New City, which was the church that I planted, and it, his will seemed so obvious to me, with regard to making this merger happen. Okay, I mean, it was clear we had a lot of men looking at this 
thing and praying hard and fasting and we concluded after three months of praying and fasting that this is in fact what God wanted us to do. We were certain of it and now summer of 2009 I was uncertain. I'm, I'm a decent theologian, okay? I, I, I understand the doctrine of God's sovereignty and providence and that there are no plan B's but only plan A. I, I understand all of that stuff but my theological knees were knocking at this point. And I'm thinking, did I make a mistake? Surely this cannot be what you had in mind. Both churches were better off apart. And I can remember saying this, God, just give me my old life back. And through these verses, he said, it's not your old life you want back. It's your old idols you want back, and I love you too much to give them to you. Listen, I I had been... You know, I'm, a, I'm an extrovert, I, I like people, and for the most part, people like me. And I had always been in places where, you know, I was accepted and approved and, and loved, and I never realized until the merger happened just how dependent I had become on human approval and human acceptance until God took it away. And I was left there bare coming to terms with my own idolatry, those things that are smaller than Jesus that I was depending on to make my life matter and to make life worth living, those things that made me feel like I was important, that I had value and that I had worth, and God was exposing all of these things in my life. And As a result, God and his gospel became more real and more relevant to me than ever. Jesus plus nothing equals everything ceased being simply a cognitive truth for me. It became my functional lifeline because this is what these verses told me. God reminded me that when we are united to Christ, listen, this will change your life. And it may sound basic to some of you, But if you tune it out or you say, I've heard this before, that just should mean that you need to get it in deeper. Ask God to massage the gospel deep into your bones every single day because your heart is prone to wander. And as Calvin said, it's okay to quote Calvin here, right? Okay. As Calvin said, the human heart is an idol-making factory. We take the good things of God and we turn them into ultimate defining things, things that we worship, things that we depend on to make our life worth living. And this is what God reminded me. God reminded me that when we are united to Christ, we don't need to spend our lives trying to earn the approval, earn the acceptance, earn the affection of those around us because Jesus has already earned God's approval, God's acceptance, and God's affection for us. Now think about that. Come on, you're Baptist. You should be saying amen to that. Okay, good. Okay, we're turning Coral Ridge into a vocal and expressive church which I love, okay, no, no, let it never be said of Coral Ridge that they are the frozen chosen. They are alive and well, and God's Spirit <laughs> is moving through that place. And as I tell my friends around the country, God has launched a gospel riot there. And it's exciting to be able to play a small part of that. Listen, this is gospel, and you need to preach this to yourself every day. When you are united to Christ, you don't need to spend your lives trying to earn the approval, acceptance, or affection of those around you because Jesus has already earned God's approval, acceptance, and affection for you. Okay? It was rediscovering the gospel. I was so weak at that time, and I was so afraid to lose. These people were against me. They didn't want anything in what they believed was their church to change. I had to remind him, it's not your church. It wasn't Dr. Kennedy's church before. It's not my church now. This has always been Christ's church. It was his blood that purchased her. Don't ever forget that, pastors and preachers. It's never your church, ever. It's Christ's. But these people were against me, and I was afraid to lose, and I was weak, and it was rediscovering the gospel that enabled me to see that because Jesus was strong for me, 
Listen, because Jesus was strong for me, I was free to be weak. Because Jesus won for me, I was free to lose. My identity and my security and my significance was not anchored in whether or not I won. That's why the Apostle Paul can say crazy things like to live is Christ and to die is gain. The thing that makes me me, you can't take away. Because it's my union with Christ that gives me the meaning and the purpose and the security and the significance and the value and the worth that I long for. And that's something the world cannot take away. Listen, life cannot beat a man or a woman who isn't afraid to lose. And only the gospel can give you that kind of power and freedom and liberation. In Christ, my identity is secure, which frees me to give everything I have because in Christ I have everything I need. Hey, think about that. There's a lot of stuff in the Bible about generosity and sacrificial living and all of those things that are good. An Ameri- comfortable American Christian should be more concerned about those things than we currently are. But... The only place where you can get the power to become sacrificial and generous is the gospel. You have to understand that because I already have everything I need in Christ, I am therefore free to give my life away. That'll change your relationships, people. That'll change your marriage because now you don't need anything from your spouse. Everything you need, you already have in Christ, which frees you to sacrificially give to your spouse without needing anything in return. That changes everything. That's gospel. Changes everything. Listen, the difference between living for God and living for anything else is that when we live for anything else, we do so to gain acceptance. But when we live for God, we do so because we are already accepted. You see, according to the Bible, Real slavery is living your life trying to gain freedom or trying to gain favor. Real slavery is living your life trying to gain favor. Real freedom is living your life because you already have favor. Big difference. So what are you living for? Who are you living for? What these verses taught me during the darkest season of my life is this. Because of Jesus' finished work for me, I already had the justification, approval, acceptance, security, freedom, affection, cleansing, new beginning, righteousness, and rescue that I was longing for. It was already mine. I didn't need it from anything or anyone outside of me. The greatest threat to gospel advancement in your life is not anything or anybody outside of you. And the greatest threat to gospel advancement in this world are not the idols outside the church, but the idols inside the church. I remember going through difficult times as a teenager, and I was really, really bad. Uh, Really bad, not like kind of bad, not like Christian bad, like non-Christian bad, okay? And uh, I remember saying to my mom on different occasions, I just want to move away. My problems will go away if I go away. And my mom would always look at me, you know, with a smile and sort of a sassy look on her face and a southern twang and say, honey, if you move, you're just taking your greatest enemy with you, which is you. She's right. Listen, Nathan, my middle son, had to memorize this for school in second grade, and I'll close with this. And it describes the kind of freedom and security that God's grace and peace grants us. I love this. Some of you may may have heard it. It was amazing hearing a bunch of second graders say this in unison. It's called the fellowship of the unashamed. I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. The die has been cast. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of Jesus. Therefore, I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. 
My past is redeemed, my present is empowered, and my future is secure. I'm done with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tamed visions, mundane talking, cheap giving, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, praise, or popularity. I don't have to win, be first, be right, recognized, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith, lean on his presence, love with patience, live by prayer, and labor with power. My goal goal is God's glory. My face is set. My pace is fast. My road is narrow. My way is rough. My companions are few. My guide is reliable and my mission is clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, shut up, let up, or slow up until I have stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, and spoken up for the cause of Christ. I must go till he comes, give till I drop, preach till all know, and work till he stops me. Christ has qualified me to become a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I am his and he is mine. Now that kind of life is not possible apart from the gospel. You've got to know that all of the security and all of the meaning and all of the purpose and all of the significance and this, what makes you you, what makes your life matter, you already have in Christ. And then you're free to die. Free to die. The best kind of freedom and the only kind of freedom that the gospel offers. Let me pray for us. Father, fill us with your spirit by teaching us your gospel. Take these gospel truths and weave them deep into the fabric of our being. Massage them deep into our bones and change us so that we leave here today far different and far freer than when we came. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.